We're going to read Luke's take on the Christmas story. Lots of verses, actually. And uh, you can follow along on the screens, or if you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter number 2. <clears throat> and let's read together. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. It's interesting to me uh, that Luke includes notes like that uh, because they're unnecessary. And I think the fact that he includes them is great evidence to, to the reality of what's going on here. If this was a once upon a time story, then details like Quirinius being the governor of a particular place don't matter. But if this really happened and Luke is trying to give a factual account, then details like this bolster the reality that what he's saying is, in fact, a real account. Verse number three. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Have you ever noticed that? When the Lord's glory shows up in Scripture, it's scary. They were terrified, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. They needed a sign because when they go looking for a baby, there may have been more than one baby born that night. But the circumstances of this birth would be a sign Specifically, that they would find a baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. You don't lay babies in mangers. You know what a manger is? It's like a horse trough. So if you go to Bethlehem looking for a baby, you might find several that were born tonight. But when you find the one lying in the horse trough, you'll know that's the right one. <laughs> suddenly, as soon as the angel gave that news... Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace. Somebody say peace. Peace, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned to their fields, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Let's pray. Lord, as we read through this familiar story, I pray that you would speak to us in a fresh way, that this Christmas would be more about you and the reality of what you have done and want to do for us than ever before in our lives. Speak to us today by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody help me say amen. amen. You may be seated. I, 
I was, I was, I was really trying to figure out what to do today because I don't really like to preach about a holiday <laughs> because, um, I don't know, I just, I just don't enjoy it. Like on Mother's Day, I don't like to preach about moms. On Father's Day, I don't like to preach about dads. I just feel like it's too on the nose. And so today, I really felt like we should read the Christmas story, but also didn't want to preach about Christmas. Is that all right? Do I sound like a Grinch? Okay, trying not to. Uh, but I landed on it, and I really feel like God is going to speak to us today through this story about some things maybe that, that we've heard before, maybe some things we haven't heard before, but my hope is that we leave here with something that we can do with what we hear. So the, the writer of this account that we just read is, is Luke. The book takes his name. This is Luke chapter number two. Luke was a doctor. He was a physician. He was a close friend of Paul. He was also a close friend of Mark. Much of the book of Luke, as, as well as the book of Matthew, relies on the book of Mark. Mark was probably the first gospel written, not the first book in the New Testament, but the first of those four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And so Matthew would have had a copy of Mark's gospel, and Luke would have had a copy of Mark's gospel. And it was important for Luke to, to pull resources like this because Luke's goal in writing this book, and if you read the first chapter of, of Luke, you'll, you'll catch this, but his point in writing this about Jesus is to give an orderly account of the life and ministry of Jesus. And so Luke gets all the evidence he can find. He gets Mark's story, which Mark's story would have, been, would have come probably from Peter uh, because Peter and Mark were close. And, and he talks to people who were there, like Paul and like other disciples and, and apostles. And he most likely even talked to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And I think uh, Luke tips his hat to that fact in verse number 19 that we just read, whenever he says, but Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. How would Luke know that unless Mary told him that? You know what I'm saying? Uh, unless she's telling this story to Luke as he's writing down to create an orderly account of the life and ministry of Jesus. And then maybe Luke says to Mary as she's telling this story about all these shepherds and angels and wise men, all this stuff going on. I wonder if Luke, like a good interviewer, said, and what was going on in your mind? This is insane. And Mary offered, like, I just, I just, just, treasured all these things in my heart, just thought deeply about them. And so again, when we read the book of Luke, more than any other of the four gospels, we read a detailed account of the life and ministry of Jesus. Luke gives more detail, unnecessary detail than any other gospel writer, and it's because he's a physician who's into detail and because he wants to explain Jesus to somebody who didn't see him and walk with him and live with him. And he wants to do it in a way that is orderly and factual. And so today, I want to I kind of divide this long text into three sections. The first section I want to talk on is, is from a phrase we got out of the text, uh, glory to God. Somebody say glory to God. Here's the thing. Everything about this story and, and really everything about our life is all for the glory of God. There are lots of characters in this story, angels and shepherds and all, all these things, Joseph and Mary and Jesus himself. All of this is going on, and if we're not careful, we can begin to think that Mary is the point of the story, or shepherds are the point of the story, or this or that is the point of the story. But the common thread we see throughout this entire text is everyone begins at some point to praise God. 
The angels praise God. The shepherds praise God. Mary and Joseph praise God. It's a common theme that we can often overlook that all of this and really all of life is for the glory of God. God is at the center of this story. God is behind the scenes of this story. God is orchestrating the comings and goings of this story. This is interesting to me. In Luke 2, 1, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the, of the entire Roman world. Well, Caesar issues a decree. Caesar issues a rule. Everybody's got to go back to their hometowns, which meant Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem. It looks like Caesar is the one making them travel out of their way. But oh, there had been prophecies about a Messiah that would be born in Bethlehem. And so what do we see happening here? Not just Caesar randomly issuing a decree for the purpose of taxes, but the reality of God behind the scenes. Caesar is ruling, but God is in charge. It's just about time for the baby to be born. It's just about time for the Messiah to enter the world, and he's got to come through Bethlehem. And so God himself whispers into the mind of Caesar, issue a census. And that's, that's, that's important for our world today because as we watch the news and we, we think about who's running the world and who's in charge and what party and this, that, or the other, other it's important to remember that while men may rule, God is in charge. And that ultimately we're not trusting in men, we're trusting in God to perform his will. When we get in our flesh, we can look at life and look at the world and look at the people in charge of entertainment and gov government and say, oh, it's all going to hell in a handbasket. Well, hey, not if God has anything to do with it. God is still in charge. God is still ruling. And God knows how to work through rulers, whether they are cooperating willfully or ignorantly. Caesar must have thought he had a great idea, but in reality, it was God working through him. And so I guess what I would say to believers today is lift your eyes a little bit higher. Lift your eyes a little bit higher that God knows how to work through men. God raises up kings and bring down kings. God raises up presidents and brings down presidents. God puts in who he wants in and God knows how to work through them even when it looks like he can't or isn't. Is anybody grateful to know the one who's in charge? My great-grandmother used to write letters to the president. She lived in Hornbeck, Louisiana. The people from Louisiana don't know where Hornbeck is. But if she got mad about something, she'd write a letter to the president. President... Kennedy, President Johnson, President Nixon, they all got letters from Maddie Duplissy. That was her name, Maddie Duplissy. She even got a letter back from one of them at one point, probably from a secretary. One time her mom helped me with a story. My, my grandpa got in trouble at school. They were going to kick him out of school, so she went down to the school and threatened to beat up the principal. She knew how to get things done. And the way you get things done is go to the one at the top. Well, let me just remind you, you have an audience with the one at the top. You don't have to write a letter to the president. You can call on the name of the Lord our God because though men may rule, God is in charge. God knows how to get done what you need done. God knows how to perform his will even when circumstances don't look to be in your favor. So Caesar issues an edict, but really it's to get, and imagine this, the entire Roman world was affected, but it was really to get two people in the right place. Amazing, amazing. It's for his glory. He's in all of it. And my encouragement is lift our eyes a little bit higher. And so while all this is going on, Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem and, and, and the baby's born. There's no room for them at the end. They're most likely in a cave somewhere surrounded by animals and Mary gives birth. Well, while all of this craziness is going on, 
Some other craziness is happening just outside of Bethlehem on a dark night in the hills. Verse number nine, it says, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. I want you to get this picture. There are shepherds out watching their sheep. It's nighttime. They're probably asleep. Maybe there's somebody up taking watch. But for the most part, they're, they're laying down. They're camping for the night. And all of a sudden, the glory of the Lord fills the sky. Nobody's asleep now. As a matter of fact, they're more than awake. They're terrified. What's going on? Can, can you imagine that? Have you ever been out in the country on a dark night and it's just, just black darkness everywhere? Well, imagine you're out there and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, before electricity, a light makes it like noon outside. What would you do? Like, oh my God, it's, it's all, you know, I see the light, it's over. That's what they did. They, they freak out so much so that the first thing the angel says is, don't be afraid, don't be afraid. It's like me when I walk in the house and my wife wasn't expecting me to be home early. I'm like saying, hey, hey, it's me, it's me. So I don't need her coming around the corner with a weapon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> But what did the angel announce? The angels announced that for the first time in centuries, the presence of the Lord was returning to the earth. Let's use the shepherds on a black night and the light opening up the sky as a metaphor. I think it is. The earth had been dark for hundreds of years. God's presence had, had withdrawn from the earth. He's not speaking to people. He's not moving on prophets like he did in the Old Testament. He spoke to Malachi and then he withdrew his presence. The world was dark. And then the light came. You know, that's what God does. God at, at various times because of, of, of the sin of men and women, even now, God will seemingly go, go quiet. He's still in charge but quiet and the world gets dark so much so that we think this is all wrapping up pretty soon and then and this is his habit he steps in and in the darkness he shines a marvelous light can I tell you and this is just me uh, praying and believing, but I'm believing that God's about to step into the world in a way that he hasn't in a long time. I believe that the darkness in our world, the darkness around us is about to be dispelled by the presence of God. I believe that we are at the beginning of the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. I believe that just like shepherds on a dark night, the presence of the Lord, the glory of the Lord is going to light up the earth again. We're going to see more people saved than ever before. More people filled with the presence of God than ever before. I don't just mean here at Champions. I do mean here, but I mean worldwide. I believe that the world is dark enough that God is about ready to step in and bring his glorious light. I wonder if there's anybody in the room that wants to help usher in the greatest revival in the history of the world. Revivals like we read about, revivals like we learn about, revivals like scripture talks about. I believe that believers can usher in the revival of God. Here's what, here's what scripture says. We're waiting on Jesus to do it, but he says, let your light so shine that men and women may see your light and glorify your Father in heaven. You know how I believe God is gonna step into the darkness now? Through believers. We're waiting on him to crack open the roof and make his presence known. Well, hey, he came to the earth and he's coming back one day. But right now he says, you go out there and be me to your world. Reflect the light to your world. The world needs more boldness from the church than we've ever had. More willingness to serve and share and preach than ever before. Because as we live in a dark world, we are the ones who don't just know the light, but we possess the light. Yes. Yes. And I genuinely believe it's time for us to put the light up on a hill 
instead of hiding it under a bushel, right? Is that the song? This little light of mine, right? (laughs) Matthew 4.16 said it this way, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. My prayer is that the people in your home see a great light. The people in our community see a great light. The people in our city, in our nation, in our world will see a great light from believers reflecting the ultimate light of Jesus Christ. They've seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. And this is what God does. And this is what he wants to do through you and through me. To be light in dark places. And life to dead and dying places. We talk about revival But revival is not just excitement. It's breathing fresh life into. I really hope that for all of us, these next couple of months, it's it's my intention to try to help in this way, but that we breathe fresh life into our faith, that we come alive again personally, that the light that is dim in some of us would blaze greater and brighter than it ever has before. For our benefit for the world's benefit, but ultimately for the glory of God. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. The next section, I want to say peace to men. So glory to God, peace to men. Jesus came to solve our greatest problem to the glory of God. We are the beneficiary, but it's all for the glory of God. What was our greatest problem? Luke 2, 10 and 11. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Say good news. Good news that will cause great joy for all people. Okay, what's the good news that will bring great joy? Verse number 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign. And it goes into the peace to you. Luke 2, 14. Jump there. Glory to God in the highest heaven. Somebody say glory to God. It's all for the glory of God. And on earth, peace. You know your greatest problem? It's not a money problem, a relationship problem, a, uh, an emotional problem, a mental problem. You know what your greatest problem is? A lack of peace between you and God. That's man's greatest need, is for there to be peace between us and our creator. And, and this would have been big news for the world at that time because uh, Caesar Augustus, arguably the greatest of all the Roman emperors, uh, and Julius, his uncle, had ushered in what they called the Pax Romana, or the, the peace of Rome, meaning there was a few decades where there was no war, and they declared peace in the Roman Empire. But here's what a philosopher of that day said, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, from grief and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which men and women yearn for more than they ever yearned for outward peace. Men have been able to create times of peace on the earth, but only Jesus can create a life of peace in your heart. Only Jesus can bring peace where there was hostility. I genuinely believe there are lots of people walking around with what they try to self-diagnose as all kinds of issues when in reality the greatest issue is that there is no peace in their heart between them and their creator. You were created to be in an unbroken relationship with God. You were created to walk with God and talk with God and be in concert with God. And as long as sin puts up a barrier between you and God, there is no peace in your life. You can make all the money you can make. You can have all the success that you can garner. You can have all the relationships that you want. You can do, feed all of your flesh's desires to the highest degree. But as long as there is hostility between you and God, you will never find peace. 
It is man's greatest need, and it is why Jesus came to the earth. It's why it was good news that would bring great joy, because the only one who could bring peace for the first time in centuries had stepped onto the face of the earth, and those living in darkness are about to see a marvelous light that I don't have to grope my way through in darkness and in brokenness and in hostility between me and God. But I can know God, I can know peace, and I can see a great light. Come on, is there anybody grateful for the good news? Is there anybody with great joy because of the good news that you can be at peace with your Savior? And here's the thing, everybody. And this is why Jesus is not like every other person who's founded a religion on the earth. Because Jesus didn't come just to bring peace. He came to be our peace. And and this is why you can't have Christianity without Christ. You can follow the book as well as you want, but if you don't know Jesus in a personal way, then you will not experience the power and the peace of Christianity. Christian principles have shaped the world, but even Christian principles without Christ fall short. Because it's not about keeping a way of life It's about knowing the Savior and surrendering our life to Him. He didn't come just to bring peace by teaching and talking and instructing. He came to be our peace, ultimately by giving His life on the cross to pay the penalty for our sin. Here's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2, 14. For He Himself is our peace. He's made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. See, before we know Jesus, before we surrender our life to him, we are in a hostile relationship with God. Even if we don't express it with our mouth or even know it at the front of our mind, the way God views those outside of a relationship with him is that there is a dividing wall of hostility because our flesh is hostile against the holiness of God. And so Jesus comes and with his life and ultimately his death and resurrection, he comes, as we sang about earlier, to tear down the barrier, to create peace where we are restored to an unbroken, unfettered relationship with our creator. That's why you need Jesus. You don't need Jesus to get rich. You don't need Jesus to to just, so you don't feel guilty about what you did last night. You need Jesus to put you in a right relationship with God, to tear down the hostility between you and God and create peace in your soul. No one else and nothing else can do that. Only Jesus can. Only Jesus can. And so, what do we do with all of that? Let's go, let's go back to those shepherds out on the hill. Because I think in some ways, we're those shepherds. We're living in a dark night. In one way or another in your life, God is shining his light or has shown his light. What do you do with that? Once you've seen the light, once you've heard the word, what do you do with what you've seen and what you've heard? Luke 2, 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord told us about. It would have been weird if, if all of this had happened. I mean, they just saw the glory of God. 
they just heard an angel speak. And then after he spoke, thousands of angels showed up. Can you imagine the scene? Then the angels go away. It would have been weird if they looked at each other and said, well, let's get back to bed. Morning's going to be here before we know it. No, what did they do instead? We've we got to do something about this. Let, let's go see what he's talking about. Yes. And so when God speaks to you, when God turns the light on in your life, it's odd to just go about life as usual. Right? To just, the point is not just to hear and know. The point of the gospel is to go and see or go and do. And so here's, here's what I want to give you, kind of an application point. What do you do when you've seen the light? Well, you respond with faith. You take some next steps. You do something with what you've heard. And I love this. They went to see not to investigate whether or not they could believe, but they went to see because they believed. They didn't go in doubt. They went in faith. Let's go see this thing that he told us about. And so... They went. Here's the faith response. I believe what God says is true, and I'm going to live my life as if it's true. Yes. You know, that's what the Christian life is. I believe what God says about me, about him, about life, about morality. I believe what God says is true, and I'm going to live my life as if it is true. Again, it's not enough just to hear and know as a believer. It's for us to go and live, go and do. James 1.22 says, do not merely listen to the word because hearing and knowing and, and feeling good about that, a lot of times we come to church and we hear and we feel better about ourselves. But if that's all we do, then James says, you're deceiving yourself. You're not really getting out of it what you think you're getting out of it. Because hearing and knowing is great, but going and living is the point. Yeah. Y'all all right? Yeah. Okay. How do, how do I respond in faith. You take next steps. And I know we use that, that language a lot here, but it really is important that all of us recognize that we all have next steps to take, that God is constantly calling us to come and see or to go and live. You know what I'm saying? All of us have next steps to take. And I think as a believer, we should from time to time take 5, 10, 15, 30 minutes to just kind of figure out where I am as a Christian and what's God calling me to? What's next? How can I continue following Jesus? It's, it's relatively simple in the beginning because if you are not a believer, you need to cross the line of faith and become a believer. That's your next step. If you become a believer, then you, you need to be baptized. That's a great next step. And we're baptizing this month on the third Sunday, not the fourth Sunday. Because if you come on the fourth Sunday, I'm going to be at home opening gifts for my children. But on the third Sunday, we're going to baptize people. And so if you're a believer and you haven't been baptized, December 18th is your day. Uh, if you're a believer, whether you've been baptized or not, you need to connect with the local church. You need to come to Growth Track next month. And uh, we've got some news about Growth Track. It's actually going to start happening on Sundays starting next month. And so on January 8th, you need to be in Growth Track. Take a next step. Connect with the family of God. Connect with the body of God. There's some folks here, you need to begin serving. You've been consuming long enough. You got to start contributing, whether that's tithing, giving, serving, whatever it may be. Again, as the family of God, we all bear responsibility for the work of God. And so if we believe what God is saying, we respond as if it's true. And we live lives that make a difference for his kingdom. That's what the shepherds did. They didn't just go back to sleep and talk about that experience they had. They stepped towards it and stepped it out. As a matter of fact, when they, when they got to Bethlehem, they, they couldn't help but tell everybody about what they had seen. You know, as believers, we still have a responsibility to tell people about Jesus. 
Whether you're good at that or not, we all bear responsibility to tell people about the great light that can open up their darkness. So Luke 2.15, respond with faith. Let's read verse number 16, because that's not all there is. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. The word found there in Luke 2.16, it literally means found after a search. So I didn't read, and it doesn't imply that the angel told them exactly where Mary, Joseph, and the baby were. They said Bethlehem. And at this moment, Bethlehem is overrun with people. And so the implication here is that they went to Bethlehem looking for a baby. He probably wasn't in the first cave they found. I don't even know if they knew he was in a cave. They went looking for a baby and eventually, after some perseverance, after some persistence, they found the right baby. That's why the angel said, look for the one in a manger. Because as they were looking, they probably found several. Oh, you're looking for a baby? They got kids. Nope, not in a manger. Oh, okay, well this family over here, they just had a baby. Nope, not in a manger. They, they, they went on a search looking for the baby. And so we're going to respond with faith, but we're also going to follow through in faith. Faith, faith gets us going, but faith also sustains us as we go. That's why the New Testament writer said, we walk by faith, not by sight. Because by the time you found the wrong baby five or six times, you might just say, let's go back to the field. Do what we know. But faith in what they heard kept them looking, kept them persisting, kept them persevering. And so faith gets us up. Faith gets us going, but as we go, we depend on what God said and our belief in what God said to strengthen us, to embolden us, and to keep us moving. Can can I give you some advice that is good advice, but not sexy advice? It's not what you want to hear, but it's good advice. Nothing, somebody say nothing, Nothing will grow you as a believer more than or better than years of mundane faithfulness. All all of us want to go to this conference and grow up spiritually in three days. But Nothing will grow you better than years of persevering in the things of God, even when it's not exciting, even through the difficulties of life, even through the tragedies of life, even through the disappointments of life. Getting up and being faithful to God, faithful to one church, come on, somebody say amen and faithful to his will and his kingdom on the earth on your worst days will grow you spiritually more than the greatest conference with the greatest speaker and the greatest worship in one night ever will. Some of the greatest Christians I've ever known were not famous people, but people that were faithful day in and day out. And when they were on the mountaintop, they praised God. And when they were in the valley, they praised God. When they were on the, having their best days, they worshiped God. When they were burying their loved ones, they worshiped God. And these become rocks, and these become pillars, and these become people who are unshakable. They are people who live by faith even when what they see is not adding up. 
So just go ahead and decide right now, especially if you're a new believer or a renewed believer, I'm in this for the long haul. If I have my worst year ever next year, I'm still going to be faithful to God. I'm not, I'm depending on God for everything. But if God allows me to go through a mess, I'm still going to trust that he's working through my mess and that he is in charge even when... The bottom drops out. You know, Mary, back in Luke chapter number one, she gets this crazy news from an angel and she says, be it unto me according to your word. She says, I'm in. And you'd think if you say, I'm in, I'm gonna give birth to Jesus, then it's gonna be smooth sailing from there. But the opposite was the truth. All the way up until his birth, you'd think God could at least arrange a hospital room. (laughs) Or just a comfortable bedroom. It would have been easy in that moment for Mary to say, I must have heard wrong. (laughs) Even when it looked like he wasn't involved, The manger was the sign. God God intended the manger. It wasn't he forgot and they ended up in a manger. He intended the manger so that the shepherds would know when they found the right baby. A lot of times, the difficulty in your life and your faithfulness through the difficulties in your life are a testament to people who are watching that God is real. See, we tend to think that people will say yes if they see us on our mountaintop, but really, it gets people's attention more when things aren't going well, and yet you still say, be it unto me according to your will. I will give glory to you, Lord, in every season. So we persevere in faith. We believe even when we can't see it. And we trust that God is working even in the difficulty to accomplish his will. And listen, everybody, it is about his will. You know what God loves more than you? His will. He loves you so much that he wrapped himself in flesh and paid the price so that you could be at peace with him. But his will is ultimate. And so God will allow you some difficulty to accomplish his will in the world around you. Is that okay? It's the truth. As long as we think we're the center of the universe, we're going to be disappointed by God. But if we recognize that God is behind everything, God is the point of everything, him getting glory is the highest uh, response from all of us, then we'll know that sometimes God allows difficulty so that he gets the glory and his will is done on the earth. I feel like Pastor Steve right now. Luke 2.20. So we respond with faith. We take next steps. We follow through in faith. Mundane faithfulness. For years. For a lifetime. Perseverance. Luke 2.20. I love this. The shepherds returned to their fields. Glorifying and praising God. For all the things they had heard and seen. Which were... Just as they had been told. When they persevered, eventually, they saw exactly what they had been told. It may have looked along the way like we were mistold. We were misled. But when they persevered until they found Jesus, it was just as they had been told. And here's what I love. And this is maybe not the point of the story, but I like it nevertheless. They went, all this happens, angels, glory, Jesus, manger, Mary, Joseph, all this stuff happens. And then what do they do? If if this had happened today, they'd go get business cards. They'd change their name on Facebook to to Prophet Shepherd. (laughs) 
apostle shepherd, minister shepherd. They'd launch a ministry and a website. They'd create a YouTube video telling their story. They'd take bookings. They'd have a booking link on their website. But what did these guys do? They went back to their fields. They went back to their life. But they didn't go back the same way they had left. They went back praising God. They went back just as they had done the people in the stable, telling everybody that they saw along the way what they had seen and what they had heard and giving glory to God. You know, here's the last point I want to give you is this. Live out your faith right there where you live. Go, go back to your job tomorrow, praising God, glorifying God, being a witness for God, talking to somebody about what God has done for you. Go right back to the same grocery store you always go to, but walk in there praising God, glorifying God, and telling anybody who will listen about what God has done for you. This is the will of God for your life. Not that we all become professional ministers because there's somebody that needs to hear it from you because they won't hear it from me. There's somebody that you know at your job. You prayed for that job. God gave you that job. Quit grumbling about that job. Quit complaining about that job. You might be the only believer in your office. Well, God's will be done in your office. Walk in there tomorrow praising God, glorifying God, and telling anybody who will listen about God. This is living life on purpose. Not that I just feel God in church, but that I glorify God seven days out of every week. Wherever I am, that I go back to my field with a praise on my lip, that I walk into my home with some praise on my lips, that I go back to that uh, husband or wife that don't love Jesus with a praise on my lip, that I go into work with some glory on my lips, that I go to Starbucks with some praise on my lips, that I live a life between Sundays that brings glory to God. I live out my faith. <laughs> Not just for a week or for a couple of weeks, but for years and decades and for a lifetime. So that when I go, the greatest thing somebody can say about me is they never wavered. They loved Jesus all the way till the end. Paul said, I've run the race, I've finished my course, and now I'm being poured out. That's what it looks like to live for Jesus, everybody, that I get started in faith, that I persevere in faith, and that I live the long haul in faith. <laughs> and I'm looking at heroes all over this room. People that God wants to use to change lives right there in your field, in your sphere of influence. There are shepherds in here who lead classrooms and lead businesses and lead customers and lead families and lead homes. God wants to use you in that sphere of influence. But you got to live out your faith. Tap into your purpose. Now, I want you to come to Growth Track next month, but I'm going to give you the short version because I'm out of time. You want to know about your purpose? It's about using your life to bring glory to God by accomplishing eternal purposes. It has everything to do with the church. You say, Chase, well, I don't know about that. God's building on the earth a church. And everybody in the family has a responsibility in what he's building. I really want to strongly encourage you, strongly encourage you as we close a year and get started on a new year to re-up a fresh commitment to God and to what he's building on the earth. Through that, you'll find your purpose. Can I pray for you? 